When it comes to games like Dungeons & Dragons, combat is arguably the aspect that holds the most mainstream appeal. Despite D&D being a role-playing game, it does trace its roots back to a monster-killing simulator, so to speak. And while many other children of the RPG classic do place more effort into the other pillars of play, such as exploration and social encounters, combat remains the strongest. 13th Age is no exception. Despite being a game focused around narrative freedom, a huge chunk of the abilities in its classes are combat abilities. This should come as no surprise, as it is more or less the norm for F20 type games. So, today we will be spending our focus on combat, monster design, and the unique feature known as the Escalation Die. But before we get into it, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel as it helps me pump out more content for you guys. Combat in 13th Age works pretty much how we've all come to expect it to in F20 games. Initiative is rolled to determine the order that everybody goes in, then PCs and monsters take turns smacking each other until one side prevails. Attacks target AC for basic weapon attacks, physical defense or PD for special attacks like poison, fireballs, or falling rocks, and mental defense, MD, for, yeah, you guessed it, mental effects. Players and monsters track hit points, and when your HP reaches zero, you are dead or dying. Another way combat has stayed the same is through its action economy. 13th Age uses the standard move quick action system found in 3.5. 3.5, or was it 3? Whatever. The older edition of D&D. For the uninitiated, each turn, players and monsters get one standard, one move, and one quick action. Actions don't carry over to your next turn. Use them or lose them. You spend your standard action to attack or cast a spell, you spend your move action to reposition or stand up, and you spend your quick action on miscellaneous stuff like reloading a crossbow. And a side note about quick actions, most of the time you're not going to have something that can be triggered with a quick action. They're sort of there, and you can usually only use them if you have a special ability that requires you to spend a quick action. In the event that you need more than one action type, you can substitute them downwards. A standard can become a move action, and a move can become a quick action, not the other way around. The system is nothing special. It works fine and is a holdover from older editions of the hobby. While I'm not crazy about it, it does serve its purpose, and tweaking it to a more modern mindset isn't impossible. A topic for the homebrew video in the distant future. All in all, 13th Age doesn't do much to change the core combat mechanics of the D20 system we have all become accustomed to, which is fine. You don't always have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to designing an RPG. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There are, however, a few noteworthy actions everybody can utilize. The first is disengaging. If you're engaged to a target, moving away would give them a free attack, called an opportunity attack. To avoid this, players can spend their move action to attempt a disengage. Unlike D&D or even Pathfinder, 13th Age handles disengaging with a dice roll. You spend your move action to declare disengage, and you roll a d20. On an 11 or higher, you disengage, moving away without consequence. On a 10 or lower, however, your move action is wasted, and you remain in place. From here, your options get limited. Option A, you can spend your standard action to make an attack, but seeing as how your plan was to escape, this may not be the best idea. Option B, you can substitute your standard action into a move action and attempt another disengage, running the risk of failing again. Option C, you can substitute for the move action, but instead just move away. Sure, the target will get an attack, but it may miss. Disengaging now becomes far more tactical as it's not guaranteed to succeed. The other standout action we have is the rally action. As a standard action, any PC can rally to regain hit points. That's right, every PC can independently heal each battle. The downside is, is that it burns your standard action, so no attack that turn. Furthermore, rallying more than once per battle requires a roll, so it's only viable once per battle, maybe twice in a pinch. This is actually another idea brought in from D&D &D 4th edition, and it's something that I personally love. 
there's now less pressure for a party to say, we need a cleric for healing. It doesn't go as far as a cleric can, mind you, but it does allow more wiggle room. Maybe now, people will actually be encouraged to play clerics that can do other things. So, how about movement and spacing? How does 13th Age handle that? Well, it does so by removing the combat grid. That's right, no grid system. Now don't panic, don't get excited. Despite making no reference to squares or feet or any other real metric of distance, the alternative here is much simpler and, in my humble opinion, much better. You see, 13th Age uses an abstract method of measuring distance. In combat, everything is either engaged, nearby, or far away. If you're engaged to someone, you are locked into melee combat, toe-to-toe, face-to-face, cheek-to-cheek. Moving out of engagement usually requires a special disengage action to avoid taking an opportunity attack. Nearby to something means it's in your immediate vicinity. You can move up to something that is nearby with a single move action, and most ranged attacks have a range of nearby. Far away targets take two move actions to reach, and most ranged attacks will take some sort of penalty at this distance. This simplification is sincerely welcome, at least at my table. While it may seem to reduce the overall tactical nature of the game, in practice it streamlines the process entirely. Maps can still be used, and as a matter of fact I strongly recommend it, as everyone will still need a visual representation of the battle. All of a sudden, however, combat becomes more freeform, allowing players and GMs to partake in more cinematic maneuvers instead of being locked into grid spaces. Give it a try, I guarantee you it will escalate your experience. Speaking of escalation, let's talk about the star child of 13th Age Combat. The escalation die is a d6, preferably the biggest one you have, that acts as a counter that ticks up over the course of a battle. In round one, the escalation die, or ED, is set to zero, meaning it's not even on the table. At the start of round two, The ED is set to 1, then it ticks up to 2 at the start of the next round, then 3, then so on and so forth, until it caps out at 6. PCs add the current ED value to all of their attacks. Basic attacks, special attacks, spells, songs, battle prayers, whatever. This wonderful mechanic represents the PCs building up momentum throughout combat. The ED has a couple of huge implications on your battles. First, It cuts down on the amount of slog. After round 3 or 4, PCs will be hitting like trucks, ensuring that things don't drag on for too long. And second, it helps players who aren't as min-max inclined as others. Because your attacks basically increase every single round, the system becomes less punishing to players who don't maximize their primary stats. As a general rule, the ED only applies to players. Monsters do not get it with a few very notable exceptions, such as dragons. As such, monsters typically have defense scores one or two points higher than their expected average to help account for this offset. And all of this is really just the tip of the iceberg. The ED has so many more applications. For example, a Chaos Mage could scramble the ED, causing it to be rolled every round instead of steadily increasing. A wizard may have a cyclic spell that allows her to cast a spell for free as long as the ED is even. A cantankerous demigod could have a one-off ability called resetting the ED to zero. There are honestly so many ways you can use this bad boy that it probably deserves its own video. So for the sake of keeping the runtime down, I will de-escalate here. How about monsters? How do they change in 13th Age? Well, monsters have their stat blocks trimmed quite a bit. Instead of looking something like this, they tend to look more like this. Most monster stat blocks will have HP, defenses, and attacks. That's it. And honestly, that's really all you need. Yes, some of the higher level ones do get a bit bigger, but the core philosophy still stands. Take only what you need, less is more. Monsters have also been subdivided into their own classes, something carried over from D&D 4th edition. Aside from troopers, the average Joes of monsters, archers attack from a distance. Blockers are tanky and able to shut down movement. 
Casters are wild cards that spit out all sorts of magic. Leaders support and empower their troops. Spoilers curse and impose conditions. And wreckers bring the hurt, and lots of it. Another interesting carryover from 4th edition is a type of monster that functions as a minion, called mooks in this edition. Mooks are a squad of weaker monsters that together make up the equivalent of a single regular one. Their weakness is their low HP, but their secret strength is their numbers. If a squad of five mooks can somehow act first in combat, then all of a sudden, that's five or more attacks headed your way. It's chip damage for sure, but it can stack up very, very fast. The brilliant part about mooks, however, is their linked HP pool. Killing one mook allows you to take any leftover damage and deal it to another one in the squad. For example, let's say you deal 15 damage to a mook that has 10 HP. That 5 leftover damage is then dealt to another mook in that same squad. The brilliant part about this is it's linked to the abstract movement system. It doesn't matter where this second mook is. The PC and the GM can organically narrate how that mook takes the extra damage. If the attack was ranged, then you may say, I fire a second arrow for this extra 5 damage. Or, my spell bounces and deals extra damage. Melee attackers can say, I swing so hard I cleave through him and just hit the next one. Heck, even if a melee attack drops the only mook next to you, you can still justify it somehow. The second mook charges in to avenge his friend and takes 5 damage from your boot to his face. Not a fan of a mook getting a free move? Fine. The sight of his comrade falling pains him so much that he takes 5 damage from pure heartache. Get creative with it. It's your life, bitch. Anyways, mooks are a great way to make the heroes feel like the Avengers, slashing through hordes of nameless minions like butter. The damage carryover keeps going, too, from the next minion to the next as long as you don't run out. This encourages PCs to drop their high damage abilities on entire squads, potentially taking out all of them in one go. Alright, so how do monsters actually feel in combat? Well, let's take a look at an example and find out. Here, we have a dire rat, or rather, a squad of them. See, this monster is labeled as a mook, meaning the intent is to use several of them at once. For this example, we'll say that there are five to a squad, looking something like this. The dire rats have the incisors-like chisels attack, dealing three damage on a hit. You'll notice that this monster doesn't roll damage, instead it deals a set value. This practice is commonplace for monsters in 13th Age, and I'm all for it. Set damage can speed up combat because you're not rolling as many dice, and it actually makes monsters slightly more dangerous. Yes, it's average damage, but it's consistent. Monsters with set damage will never have a bad damage roll. The attack also has an ability called Vicious Instincts. At the end of a PC's turn, each dire rat it's engaged with deals one damage automatically. From this single attack alone, we get a built-in strategy for this monster. Dire rats will want to gang up on heroes to capitalize on that free chip damage. Several monsters also have a section called Nastier Specials. These are optional abilities that the GM can add on if a fight is too easy or if they just want to be a jerk. The Dire Rat in the playtest document has four Nastier Specials to choose from, but I'm only going to be going over one right here. Squealing Pack Attack reads, Each rat gets a plus one increase to its critical hit range per other Dire Rat engaged with the target. Now, all of a sudden, if two rats engage the same target, they crit on a 19 through 20. If it's three of them, then that's an 18 through 20. If all five rats engage the same target, then they all crit on a 16 through 20. Keep in mind that, depending on the encounter level, five of these rats count as one monster. So an encounter of three squads of five rats each can turn very deadly very quickly. In the example here, each rat has 6 HP. That's right, 6 per rat. This is not the total health of the squad. Each individual one has 6 HP. So, if Sir Galavan were to deal 9 damage to one of these, then the remaining 3 could be dealt to any of the other remaining ones. 13th Age Combat opens up the doors for narrative action, which is par for the course for this system. 
It retains just enough tactical minutia to allow strategy and hand waves enough of it not to get in the way of creative descriptions. The Escalation Die is a powerful tool that is simple in concept and complex in its uses. And while the action economy is nothing to write home about, it is an old school system that many veterans are familiar with. Again, it just kind of gets the job done. That's going to do it for me, guys. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. And before I forget, here is your question of the episode. How would you modify the Escalation die for a special encounter? Would you increase the die size all the way up to a D12? Would you replace it with a die that has special effects instead of numbers? Would you make it negative to punish your players? Or would you do something completely and utterly insane? Let me know in the comments below.